The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. I'm Harlan Johnson, and on this month's show, we'll be talking about United Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month. I'm Lita Powell Drake, and today we're going to be talking about senior dental care. Keep smiling. Hi, I'm Tim Francis, and today's guest is Twyla Hansen, Nebraska State Poet. We're going to be talking with Dr. Tracy Bender with Interim Healthcare and Coddington Physical Therapy today about the subject of lymphedema. These guests and more on today's Live and Learn. Now here's Harlan Johnson. I'm Harlan Johnson, and today my guest is the Reverend David Lux, who is president of the uh, Senior Foundation. And we're going to be talking about the upcoming Keystone Award. David, welcome to the Live and Learn Show. Thank you, Harlan. It's great to be here. Well, now, let's start out. Give us a little history of this prestigious award. The, the first award that we gave was in 2011, and that went to Joe Hampton, who's, uh, of course, been very active in the community, both through business and, and his uh, community service. And then, Harlan, you received the award in 2012. It was well-deserved, and, and you also have been so active. And then last year, uh, Scott Young from the Lincoln Food Bank uh, received the award. Well, and now the, this is just the last year, and this year's going to be the fourth year. Uh, yes. Before the Keystone Award, there were a number of uh, recipients of a, uh, a community award, I believe yes. it was called. Yes, that started in 2005, and uh, former Mayor Helen Busalis was the first recipient, and then uh, Gil Savory in 2006, who was a news, uh, Lincoln Journal Star uh, newspaper editor. Leela Shanks uh, received the award in 2007. Jerry Joyce, a housing developer for seniors, was a recipient in 2008. So we've, we've had a, a longer history of, of giving out an award and, and uh, an impressive group of people. Well, yes, that, that's quite a repertoire of community leaders, and I'm humbled to think that I'm even listed as part of that. <clears throat> now, tell us about this year's Keystone Award coming up. The, the Keystone Award presentation uh, will be um, May 15th uh, uh, at noon at the Co Lincoln Country Club. Uh, the, uh, we're taking nominations now for the award, but it will be presented on that day. Now, you mentioned Scott Young was a recipient last year, and he's agreed to be the master yes. of ceremonies. Who, who's going to be the speaker this the, year? The program and main speaker is Dick Turpin, uh, who was uh, past director of the uh, State Game and Parks and Recreation and very humorous speaker. So it'll, it'll be an interesting program. Yes, I've heard Dick uh, a number of times. Uh, now, uh, where can people get tickets? They can call the foundation office, which is the number is 402-441-6179. They can also go to the website, seniorsfoundation.org. All right. This is considered a fundraiser for the Senior Foundation in order to do some of the things that we do in the community. And uh, we are getting close to finalizing the one campus there at Vets Hospital. So, uh, David, thanks for coming and being part of the Live and Learn Show and for uh, your work with... Uh, the Senior Foundation, and for helping to promote the Keystone Award. Thank you very much, Harlan. It's never too late to live and learn. Can you sing, dance, do magic? or have another talent? Come show it off at Lincoln Seniors Got Talent. Aging Partners is hosting a talent show featuring local seniors in honor of Older Americans Month. The show tapes at 9 a.m. Friday, April 18th at the Alt Rec Center. For more information, contact Aging Partners at 402-441-6156 or email zolson at lincoln.ne.gov. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Harlan Johnson. And when I was out on doing some business on personally, I met a young man at Menards that really very made a very good impression on me. Well, 
And I know that March is Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month, and so recognizing this young man had the symptoms of cerebral palsy, I asked him if he had the CP, and he said yes. And I said, would you be willing to come on our show and talk about some of your experiences? And he gladly said yes. So Johnny, welcome to the Live and Learn Show. Well, thank you, I, it means a lot. I, uh, I Thank you for asking me. Well, now, I know you've been aff afflicted with CP since birth. How many surgeries have you had? Well, my father says I've had uh, 14 of them, uh, but I only remember maybe about a handful of them, so. Okay. And so these start to clear back when you were uh, a, a real small youngster then? Yeah, about when I was five years old when I had my first one. So. Okay. Now, where did you grow up? Uh, here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay. And uh, yeah, you went to Meadow Lane School, I understand? Yeah, that was for elementary school and then uh, Goodrich for middle school and then uh, North Star Navigators for high school. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. Now, you probably, did you get bullied with your condition and that sort of thing when you were a youngster? Yeah, I did actually. Uh, when I was in elementary school and then throughout um, middle school, but um, uh, into high school, I, I, I didn't get picked on as much, but uh, I, had to, I had a good, a good group of friends to help me out throughout all okay. that too. So. Now, you went on to college where? Uh, Doan College in Crete, okay. Nebraska. All right. Uh, you graduated in four years, they tell me. Yeah, four years. All right. Now, that's accomplishment itself for anybody these days. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, I know you had to probably do some extra work during summer school and that sort of thing in order to make it in the four years. But uh, uh, what degree of mobility did you use when you were a young, young person? Uh, I started out with a walker, and then I, uh, I, when I hit uh, middle school, I, uh, I didn't use it anymore, and I just was, I just used my braces that I, on my feet there. So. Okay. Probably after some of the surgeries, had some uh, uh, bouts with a wheelchair? Yep. I, I was in my, okay. my fair share of wheelchairs. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. Talking about the wheelchairs and that. Uh, now, you were, you were very involved with the Shriners. They were uh, quite helpful with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. They uh, they are who they are who what they got me today pretty much. I owe all of my uh, I I thank my I thank them every day for it, and uh, they they've done a lot for me. You so. made a few trips to the Twin Cities uh, for the Shrine Hospital up there. Yeah, I did. Uh, too many to count, it seems, but I uh, definitely know that area pretty well. Well, the fact that you were involved with the Shriners probably indicates that you may have been involved with the Shrine Bowl sometime. Yeah, I was a uh, Shrine Bowl king for the football game and then also for the soccer team as well. Was this, uh, a, what, an honorary captain type thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they chose an honorary uh, captain uh, for an a honorary king and a queen for each year. So. Okay. Well, uh, even before these years, I know you actually played some, some baseball. Yeah, I did. I I started out with a team that was just for disabled children, and then uh, I actually played for the YMCA a little bit, and uh, I was even a pitcher at one time. Okay. Uh, now, I found it kind of amazing. You you uh, majored in uh, business administration, but you had a, a minor which uh, uh, follows your talents uh, here, too. Uh, what was your minor in college? It was uh, just music, general music. Okay, uh, and you played? I played the trumpet. Okay, yeah. and I know you were in the Gators marching band. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, that was fun, and I... Uh, um, music was kind of my my thing, and uh, throughout high school and college, I, I really excelled in that. Um, at, you know, obviously, athletics wasn't uh, something I wasn't going to excel in, and so uh, I turned to music, and uh, I actually thrived in it. And um, that I actually got a pretty good scholarship uh, at for Doan College, and uh, very thankful for that. So. Well, you participated in Allstate and... Yeah, uh, I made Allstate uh, numerous times and I made uh, also quite a bit of uh, honor bands as well. All right. Now, uh, I, uh, well, I checked up on you a little bit. I went out to North Star. Oh, you did? Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, 
you know, you're well known out there. <laughs> well, I, oh, for the good things. Oh, I good, good. Yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> you're a distinguished alumni. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And your picture is on the Wall of Fame. It sure is, yeah. Okay. Well, I slipped out there and I took a picture of it, so uh, we'll be able to see that uh, with, um, uh, with part of our, uh, uh, and there we are on the screen right now, the uh, Wall of Fame. Well, now, uh, after you graduated from college, well, even before you, were you an intern then at Menards? Yeah, I did. Uh, I interned there, and uh, I'm also part of the management program they have there as well. So. Okay. So, uh, yeah, they got a good future ahead of you, and uh, uh, they're, uh, uh, yeah, they're taking a little bit of a chance with you, but uh, mm -hmm. I know they're impressed with uh, your success, and, and uh, so it looks good up there. Uh, now... Uh, I, uh, I I went so far as to check with the Cere Cerebral Palsy Association, and uh, uh, they said, "Oh, we want to meet that young man because we'd like for him to be one of our spokesmen." So uh, you're going to be hearing from CPE as a result of my digging into your background and talking about uh, cerebral palsy. So, uh, Johnny, uh, thank you for where you've come to where you are today and uh, what you've accomplished. Uh, I'm, I'm so impressed uh, that, uh, uh, now I know I'm gonna talk about your surgeries and we said we wouldn't talk, but you had your hips uh, uh, moved. Yeah, they were actually uh, rotated. Rotated, mm -hmm. and then had to be rotated back? Well, then they, had, they put plates in them to correct my the growing of my hips, and then they had to take the plates out eventually. So I, I was, that was even another surgery they had to do later on. But, and then I also had um, a couple of the bigger ones I had too were um, had a back rhizotomy as well, and then they also uh, lengthened my hamstrings. And those uh, those really took me out for a while too. But uh, I'm a I'm a fighter on those. I I never let those get me down. So I, I've always uh, driven through and and not letting anything hold me down, so. Well, hey, yeah, so impressive. Uh, when they tell me an individual had 14 surgeries, uh, I kind of wince because uh, uh, some of those were not very pleasant, I'm, I'm sure. But Johnny, thank you for coming and being on the Live and Learn show. And uh, hey, we wish the best for you uh, down the road here. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you asking me to be on the show. All right. Live and Learn will be back right after this. I have someone from United Cerebral Palsy Organization of Nebraska here uh, to tell us a little bit more about uh, what's happening with uh, uh, UCP of Nebraska. Uh, Ken Broman is a member of their board of directors. And so, Ken, welcome to the Live and Learn Show. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. All right. Now, how long have you been a part of U UCP of Nebraska? Yeah, I joined UCP of Nebraska back in the late 1990s. Uh, a friend of mine had asked me to join a, an organization that was uh, seeking some board members. And so I decided yeah, let's give it a shot and see what I can do to help out. All right. Now, I know you've just had a big fundraiser. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, the Barstool Open is a fundraiser that we began my first year on the board. Uh, so that goes back to the late 1990s again here in Lincoln. And it's essentially just a great opportunity for a lot of people to get together, have a little bit of fun, patronize some great local establishments, bars and restaurants, and really raise awareness and support UCP of Nebraska through their donations. So it's a lot of fun and it's a, it's a great time had by all. Okay, so now what's coming up uh, that the board is focusing on? Yeah, you know, UCP of Nebraska always is asking the question, what is it that we can do to help fill the gaps for those individuals that need different assistance with different things? And especially those with cerebral palsy and other debilitating diseases or illnesses. One of the big things that we've been focusing on, of course, here in Lincoln is we have a tech tot tech tools lending library at Madonna Rehabilitation Hospital. That's a great opportunity for people to see what's out there for assistive devices for individuals. We also have the Family Focus Program, and the Family Focus Program 
it was a great opportunity for families that are in very similar situations to get together and enjoy some time. We have things like swimming events, movie nights, and a lot of different things like that. And we also are one of the bigger so sponsors of Husker Heroes, uh, and it's a great opportunity for a lot of individuals to meet their heroes and things like that, um, that are Husker players here in Lincoln and so on. So we're doing quite a bit, and again, the thing that we always ask ourselves, what can we do to help and fill the gaps that are needed? Okay, now I personally have a, a long history of having served on that board. Uh -huh. And uh, so are there any new developments, new treatments or new things that are happening? Yeah, that's the great thing of being a national organization such as United Cerebral Palsy. We in Nebraska, of course, are really focused on the services that we can provide families and individuals here. But some of our dollars go back to help afford the research that's going on. Some of the things that are pretty interesting right now are, of course, some stem cell research, uh, mostly the blood from the umbilical cord that really focuses on how we might be able to diagnose and treat different illnesses such as CP. Okay, now if a family realizes that their child has been diagnosed with cerebral palsy, where do they turn? That is exactly the best part of our program is that we are there to help in so many different ways. The easiest way, of course, to get a hold of us is by calling us toll free at 800-729-2556. You can also reach out to us through our website, which is ucpnebraska.org. One of the things, though, that we encourage everybody to do is go ahead and find their intervention type specialist through their school district, whether you're young or old, because they're able to help really identify those things that are gonna allow us to really help those individuals and those families. Now, I know that there's helps out there, and I know that they can make changes. And Ken, you've done a very good job in, of identifying that. Thank you for coming and being a part of this program, which is focusing on the celebration of United Cerebral Palsy Month here in March. So thank you, Ken, for being with us on Live and Learn. Thank you, Harlan. Thank you very much. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Can you sing, dance, do magic, or have another talent? Come show it off at Lincoln Seniors Got Talent. Aging Partners is hosting a talent show featuring local seniors in honor of Older Americans Month. The show tapes at 9 a.m. Friday, April 18th at the Alt Rec Center. For more information, contact Aging Partners at 402-441-6156 or email zolson at lincoln.ne.gov. Hi, I'm Chris Beckenbaugh. Welcome back to Live and Learn. We're going to be talking with Dr. Tracy Bender with Interim Healthcare and Coddington Physical Therapy today about the subject of lymphedema. Yes. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, Chris. Now, Tracy, you've been with us before and we talked a little bit about lymphedema, so let's refresh for those of us who haven't seen the previous segment. Um, tell us again, what is lymphedema? Lymphedema is a protein rich swelling that can affect any part of the body. Okay. So the circulatory system and the lymphatic system both are like roadmaps in our body as you as you shared with us. Yes. And lymph edema, uh, what happens? What causes this condition? Well, actually there, there are a few things that can cause it. Um, any interruption in the system such as surgery or a traumatic injury, uh, cancer treatment, radiation, those types of things. Also um, increased size of a fat cell or decreased circulation to an area of the body. All of those are, are very common factors. Okay, so how would someone uh, in our audience recognize that they had lymphedema? Well, typically the, the swelling would be your first clue, just noticing that you have swelling and it may come and go or it may be there for a period of time. Any changes in the skin, hardening to the skin, um, infections, frequent infections, cellulitis, which is an infection of the skin cells. Okay. So you're going to notice some swelling. Not necessarily painful though? Sometimes it can be painful or a tight feeling, a full feeling, um, but typically people tell me that it is not painful. Okay. 
And there are different levels of lymphedema, right? Yes. Okay. Lymphedema is in four stages. The latent phase is the first stage where you may feel a, a heaviness, may not even be able to visually see swelling. And stages one, two, and three get progressively worse as they go up. Okay, and then the, the, the worst stage, you, we, there's another term for that that we might be familiar yes. with? stage three lymphedema is elephantitis, also known as elephantitis. Okay, and that's where we see significant swelling and maybe yes. skin breakdown? Some changes to the skin. Wounds okay. can be typical with that stage as well. Okay, so we're talking major change in the body yes. at that point. Yes. All right. Um, is it curable, Tracy? Lymphedema is not curable. It is something that you manage, similar to diabetic management. Um, but there are two stages in the beginning, the latent stage and stage one lymphedema, that are considered reversible with proper treatment. Okay, and what might some of those treatments be? Well, we treat lymphedema with something called complete decongestive therapy, and that has six components. It's, it's extensive, mm -hmm. okay? The first component uh, to complete decongestive therapy is really good skin care. Whether you have open wounds or not, we want to take really good care of that skin and make sure that there are no cracks or openings in the skin where bacteria can come in and cause that cellulitic infection. Okay, so okay. If, if I'm at home and I'm, I'm doing some self-management, what does that look like? Frequent washing or not too hot of water? Tell me more about that. Sure, absolutely. Um, I use some very neutral skin products. I use usually a Cetaphil cleanser, which is neutral and it has no additional um, fragrances or anything like that. Okay. Okay, and I use that. It's very gentle on the skin and it can be wiped away easily. And then you want the skin to be dried, not moist areas if there are um, skin folds and things like that. You want to make sure those are dry so you don't develop a fungal infection in that area. Okay. And then I use typically a Eucerin lotion and that has a, a neutral pH balance as well. And that can help prevent uh, the additional growth of the bacteria that naturally grows on your skin. Okay, so no color, no fragrance. Correct. Just keep it neutral. We don't want to be scrubbing with a bar of lava, but we yes. want to we want to treat the skin gently. Yes, we do. And then keep it dry. Yes. Okay. And if we have any wound issues going on, typically I would follow the, the direction of the wound doctor or, or whoever that is treating that person. And we can actually do the wound care treatment along with the treatment for the lymphedema. Okay, mm -hmm. so good skin care is the start of decongestive Absolutely. therapy. Absolutely, very important. All right, what's next? Okay, the next thing that we look at is something called manual lymph drainage. And not everybody is appropriate for manual lymph drainage. That's something that I look at with your medical history. But this is a very gentle, light touch massage that stimulates the lymphatic vessels as well as the lymph nodes to help improve the circulation of that system. Okay. So I know we talked about previously that the circulatory system in your body normally helps your lymph system function and, and drain properly. Yes. But you can actually do that manually from the outside. Yes, I can. My job is to know the roadmap of the body and which direction things flow and then help get that fluid moving and in, in to the circulation of the rest of the body and then that would be excreted through the urine. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then the next phase of treatment? The next phase is called compression bandaging and we actually use a special type of bandage. It looks similar to an ACE wrap but it's made just for this type of treatment. It's made of cotton and it is called, um, I messed that up, I'm sorry. Um, the short stretch bandage is made of cotton and it is safe to use day and night for treatment of lymphedema. Um, and and uh, the bandages um, have a few layers to them. So those bandages on the outside look like ACE wrap bandages and then there are some protective skin layers underneath. Okay. And that's applied in a special way um, for your particular situation depending on how much compression you need. Okay, and, and someone who knows what they're doing needs to be doing that, right? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, and it, what, are TED hose part of that? At the end of, of the treatment, when we have the legs completely decongested, we will fit somebody with a compression garment that's appropriate for them. Okay. TED hose are a compression garment. However, TED hose are meant to be a very temporary garment and typically for use in a hospital setting or after surgery. So if you're wearing TED hose for a long period of time, that, that's not the correct garment that you should be wearing most likely. There are hundreds of types on the market, lots of different companies make them, and they are made for all different ability levels. So depending on what you're capable of using, there's something out there for you. Okay, and they just need to talk to a specialist or their physician's office and find out 
I actually do compression garment fittings as well. So that's okay. part of this treatment. So okay. once we have this swelling out, you don't want to be fitted for compression while you have swelling okay. because the purpose of compression is only meant to contain swelling. So it, it's not meant for edema reduction. Okay. So that's what the treatment does. It takes the swelling down and then we fit you with something that's proper um, to keep the swelling out. Okay, so decongestive therapy with good skin care and, and then then the massage therapy that mm -hmm. goes with that. Yes. And then? We actually, while we're still in, in the earlier phases, we do exercise that also promotes circulation. Okay. Okay, so once we have all that swelling out, we fit for compression. And the last component of treatment is, is teaching a patient self-care. Okay. We want to make sure that you won't need me forever. You'll be able to manage this on your own. So once we get that swelling out and we teach you how to take care of your skin and how to use the compression garments and care for them, then that's something you can manage on your own from that point on. So exercise, you mentioned exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who's got some swelling, um, just end of the day, their feet, their legs are swelling. It's not truly lymphedema, but what kind of exercise should they be doing? What should they feet up? Should they keep walking? How do you manage that in your life? Um, elevation can be a good thing for swelling and exercise is also good because it promotes circulation. So I typically tell my patients to think about how each joint moves throughout the limb and to make sure you're moving it in each direction that it can go and that will promote the circulation and help to kind of pump that fluid out of the limb. So even people sitting at home right now watching our show should be Working those arms, working those hands, working those feet and ankles and toes. Absolutely. And, all right, just <laughs> keep moving. That's that's one one way to go at this. Um, there's so there's exercise regimens that go along with this that you prescribe for your patients. Yes, there is. Can you tell me a little more about that? Well, it depends on your particular situation. It also depends on if you have open wounds and things like that. So those are individualized and some people can benefit from strengthening along with that, which would involve adding resistance, weights or therabands, things like that. And other people simply need circulation. And so that would just be an active range of motion. Okay. And of course, as being as active as you can be in your daily life is always important. Walking safely if that involves using a device such as a walker or a cane, but being as mobile as possible promotes circulation. And are there dietary changes that people can make that might impact this treatment? Absolutely. There is no one specific lymphatic diet. Um, however, a well-balanced diet containing everything from the food groups and staying well hydrated. Sometimes people think that if they have swelling, they shouldn't have additional water in their body. Unless you have a fluid restriction for another reason, it is very good to stay hydrated because it helps every body process work better. Okay. Mm -hmm. So water? Yes. Is key. Low sodium. Low sodium. That's another thing. Okay. Keep so. the salt out. Salt makes you keep that fluid in. All right. Kay. Anything else we should be? Coffee, good or bad? Um, in, in moderation. Things are okay in moderation. All right. We also want to stay away from a lot of refined sugars and high fat foods because as our fat cells increase in size, they can actually affect the lymphatic flow. So some things people can do for themselves is really just moderate their weight. Mm -hmm. um, Keep the salt out of your diet. Not, not, don't be extreme with anything, right? Correct. And moderate exercise mm -hmm. and stay hydrated. Yes. All those good things. Most important thing to remember is that swelling is not normal. So if you have swelling, you should find out the source of the swelling and then, then seek treatment once you know the source. So if you've had surgery, and we see a lot of women after breast cancer that are wearing some kind of garment on their arm, mm -hmm. and that's part of the treatment that you might provide yes, for them? Yes, that would be a compression garment. So once that swelling has been addressed and the swelling is down, we would fit them with a compression garment that would keep that swelling down. And there are garments for daytime use, and there are garments for nighttime use as well. And so it's important to know what you need for compression, if you need it daytime, nighttime, or 24 hours. Okay. And I'm glad you mentioned surgery because swelling after surgery is typical, but swelling lasting longer than 12 weeks is not typical. It usually involves some type of lymphatic issue. Okay. So if somebody's had some surgery on an extremity and they're feeling well and they're feeling healthy again and then they start developing some swelling, they need to get in and see somebody. Yes, they do. Tracy, I have learned a great deal and I'm sure our viewers have as well. They can also get additional information in the winter edition of Living Well magazine that's produced by Aging Partners. Yes. So thank you for that and, and putting that together for us. 
And once again, this has been Live and Learn. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Thank you for joining us today on Live and Learn. I'm Tim Francis, your host. My guest today is our Nebraska State poet, Twyla Hansen. Twyla, you don't become a state poet by application, do you? You kind of work your way up to it? Well, actually, there was an application process. We, um, uh, each person who was nominated had to be agreed to be nominated. And then part of the requirement was to send in documents, um, your accomplishments and your resume and your letters of recommendation. There were certain required documents to send in to um, a committee that was composed by um, the Humanities Nebraska, Nebraska Arts Council, and the Library Commission, Nebraska Library Commission. Mm -hmm. And then the three of those groups put together a selection committee, and they were composed of writers and um, people, librarians, and people who knew about writing. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually, this was a process, so it started way last summer. And then what call went out for nominations. And then everyone who was nominated sent in their stuff. And um, then they did their selecting. And, and the names, uh, three finalists were selected. Um, Matt Mason of Omaha and Roy Shield of Lincoln were the other two. Um, finalists, and, um, and the names were sent to the governor's office. And so uh, Dave Heinemann actually made, our governor, made the final selection. Mm -hmm. You've had several books published. I have. And um, you've got kind of, a, you've got a wide audience, and you have some obligations as the state poet. Yeah, so there's, the obligations are really um, pretty simple to advocate for poetry writing in Nebraska and literacy and literature and to uh, encourage the emerging generation of writers. So emerging generation young people. So that's, that's my obligation. And um, the way I accomplish this is to give readings and um, workshops, writing workshops and um, with community groups, libraries and schools. And they're funded through Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Arts Council. And do we have a couple websites for those that we can post, perhaps? Uh, yes, humaniniesnebraska.org, I believe. And mm -hmm. um, might want to double check that, but um, and Nebraska Arts Council. Okay, okay. You're also an environmentalist. Oh, yeah. And you have been for, what, 30, 40, 50 years? A oh, long, yeah, long something time. Something like that. <laughs> How have you merged those two interests? Well, to me, everything is connected, and making poems are all about connections. And so it's very, um, I don't know, it's everything in your life kind of adds up to poetry and can be food for poetry. So I do write about nature quite a bit. I don't always write about pretty nature, but I write about um, wildlife or birds in my yard or um, sustainable ag sneaks in there and some those are some of my interests and they they have a way of finding themselves into poetry but everything to me is connected you've got a few thoughts i think for um or counsel or advice for young writers or people interested in writing what do you tell your kids your your audiences for during question and answer sessions yes well, of course, um, well, yesterday, for example, I was at the Heritage Room at Bennett Martin Library um, with the eighth grade annual middle school writing workshop. It's called The Writer Writes. And um, it's as simple as that. <laughs> we can talk about writing, but it comes down to the writer writes. And the writer sits in the chair or spends the time or pays attention to language in, um, by writing. And it's the act of writing that really helps improve your writing, so. Uh, are there influences because of technology and online things and self-publishing things and stuff like that that uh, influences what goes on in the? Oh yeah, well, um, technology is, you could argue either way, it's helped or hurt writing. I mean, um, books now on 
there's a whole thing about books on Amazon, so for example. I won't get into that, but um, people still want to have a palpable thing to hold in their hands and read, and so poetry is hard to get published, frankly, um, because it doesn't really um, pay for itself. Mm -hmm. So the smaller presses are now doing that job instead of the large presses, for the most part, unless you're super famous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a rural background, right? Right. I grew up on a farm in northeast Nebraska uh, during the 50s and 60s, which um, most farms in that area were pretty small. So then. that would be an influence? It's definitely an influence. Um, as I said, everything in your life is kind of connected, and um, I feel that those early years of of being alone, um, I had three older, I have three older brothers, and I was the youngest and the only girl, and so I spent a lot of time alone on that farm. And um, with not too many distractions, this is pre-cell uh, phones and um, internet, and those kind of things, and so I spent a lot of time outdoors and just observing my surroundings. And paying, uh, writing poetry involves paying attention, paying attention to language, paying attention to um, situations so that you have something to write about that's interesting. So um, paying attention and um, paying attention to language, really important. Well, over the years, you've had an affiliation with Wesleyan, haven't you? I worked there for um, 17 years as a horticulturist and grounds manager. And um, that's actually where I f first took my first writing class. Um, I didn't know I could be a writer, but I started taking some English classes when I was employed there. And I just happened to take a poetry class because I was interested. I had heard, um, I, I have to say this, William Clefcorn and Ted Kuzer put out a book together called Cottonwood County. And I read that and it really spoke to me. It, it, there was something there that I enjoyed. So I thought, well, maybe I could try writing my own. And so that was about 30 years ago. So one thing leads to another. Mm -hmm. It's all connected. And I was very lucky to have um, Bill Clefcorn as my first writing teacher. So. So a teacher makes a huge difference. Well, and your husband contributes environmentally. He, he's not a writer. But he's an, envi <laughs> he's a, but he's an environmentalist. Oh, yeah. Right. Citizens for Environmental Improvement, if you can think that far back, um, he used to work there. So, yeah, we've um, done the recycling thing in the, the um, use less kind of mode for several decades. So. <laughs> so I'm always amused when green now is kind of being discovered as a new concept. Right. No, there's, it's been going on a long time. And some of our families recycled because it was just you save stuff or you don't throw it away. Or right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, being environmentally conscious has really been part of my life for a long time. Um, do you want to hold up a couple of books for us? And sure. Um, this one is my latest book. It's Dirt Songs, a Plains Duet. And it's actually a, a duo with my friend from South Dakota, Linda Hazelstrom, uh, Swedish, good Swedish name. And um, we put together 50 poems each, and so we call it um, our Plains Duet. And uh, that's been a fun project. It was, it, she's very well known in South Dakota as a prose writer mostly, and, and makes her living um, by on the ranch where she grew up, and she has conducts writing workshops for women on the ranch, so it's quite a deal. And then w another book um, that's still in print is this um, Potato Soup, and both of these won the Nebraska Book Award, by the way. Um, this one is my earthy mix. <laughs> that's why I I do have a poem titled Potato Soup, but. So it's, it's these others, some of them are out of print. Um, this one here is still in print, um, Prairie Sweet. And it's my poems with uh, Dr. Paul Jonsgaard's drawings. And it's a benefit for the Spring Creek Prairie. And it's available at their gift shop. So we went through and uh, worked together and 
um, for example, here's the monarch poem and the drawing. So he drew this, uh, well, he drew this monarch for this poem that I wrote. That's a beautiful collaboration. And I understand maybe some of your poetry is being set to music. It has been. Um, one of the professors, Gene Hen Henderson at Nebraska Wesleyan did that, and, and that was fun. It was really he interesting to hear the, the, uh, the Wesleyan choir sing those. They're for women's chorus. Um, would you read a poem for us? Sure, I'd love to. I thought I'd read a spring poem. Um, it's, this is a one called Work. And the um, epigraph, which is right below the title, comes from NPR News. And it says, the honey bee can fly nearly five billion miles on one gallon of honey. Work. On spring days, you could hear it, buzzing cloud back and forth between the fence row and hives, over the rugosa roses and the field, 40 acres of clover with its billions of tiny blooms. My father grinned as he opened a top, brushed aside the bodies, pried out a frame oozing with sweetness, my hands on the extractor handle sticky with the great efficiency and substance of their labor. Worker bees, like my farmer father, combed those fields for a harvest of gold. Some years, crop failure and bad luck weather affected supply and yield. All that labor translated into a meager existence, a tightening of the belts. Worker bees kick out the drones to protect their winter food. Back then, all we needed was whatever we raised, planted, butchered, and preserved. There were no guarantees. We took care of the land. The land took care of us. All honeybees need is pollen and nectar, an unspoiled spring-fed creek, the occasional gentle hand to encourage them on. Well, that's very moving, and I want to. Thank you. Uh, that's a wonderful example. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank our guest today, Twyla Hansen, our state poet. I'm Tim Francis for Live and Learn, and don't forget, it's never too late to live and learn. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. Can you sing, dance, do magic, or have another talent? Come show it off at Lincoln Seniors Got Talent. Aging Partners is hosting a talent show featuring local seniors in honor of Older Americans Month. The show tapes at 9 a.m. Friday, April 18th at the Alt Rec Center. For more information, contact Aging Partners at 402-441-6156 or email zolson at lincoln.ne.gov. Life is short. So, if you still have teeth, smile. <laughs> We're going to be talking about dental care for seniors today. And that means you and I have lost a lot of teeth along the way, and we're going to tell you the latest in what's happening. I'd like you to meet a very special lady. Her name is Dr. Wan Lee, and she is a periodontist here in the Lincoln Periodontal Offices, and she knows what she's talking about. Welcome to Live and Learn, Dr. Wan. Thank you for having me, Lita. It's my pleasure. Now, <laughs> you're a periodontist, so explain to our viewers what a periodontist does. So what a periodontist is, is we are dentists that have additional, gone additional training in the field of periodontics, which, is, which involves the supporting structures of the teeth, including the gum tissues or gingival tissues, and the underlying bone. Uh, one of our primary goals as a periodontist is to help patients maintain um, their teeth in, in a state of health, function, and comfort, and one of our, uh, our primary um, objectives um, as a periodontist, too, is in the diagnosis and, and treatment of periodontitis. 
Well, you call it periodontitis. I've always called it periodont periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. There are almost well, there's a lot of classifications that go under periodontal diseases, and periodont periodontitis is just one aspect of it. And, and so we get so. this as we get older. It, it is very commonly seen in older patients, oh. um, but it's not necessarily a risk factor. You know, aging isn't a risk factor for, for periodontitis, but we do see it a lot more commonly in older patients just because of the lifetime accumulation of, you know, stuff. periodontal destruction. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> stuff. <laughs> stuff. Stuff happens. Yes. <laughs> now, what, what's the causes then of periodontal diseases? Mm -hmm. The primary cause of periodontal disease is that bacterial plaque that uh, remains oh, around the teeth. That's yeah, that okay. white stuff that sticks around the teeth after we eat. And, and what that does is it causes, it's sitting right up against the, the, or the um, tissues. And so that causes your body to try to react to it. And it's, const it's almost like this battle between the bacteria and your body. Your body's just constantly trying to fight it off. And it can only fight it off for so long, and that's where that you see that inflammation of the gum tissues and and so forth but what happens is over time if we're uh -oh. not cleaning those areas adequately then that bacteria starts to win that battle and then you start to lose bone which is the primary feature with with periodontitis and so the risk factors with regards to that mm -hmm. are are you know smoke or uh, plaque is the primary yeah, etiology, yeah, yeah. but then you also have the risk factors of diabetes and smoking can play a contributing factor. Like we talked about before, aging is a, a misconception that you know that it's associated with aging, but it's just again more of a, a lifetime accumulation of of destruction that causes that. So here are some of the symptoms and, and with the bleeding gums, tell us about mm -hmm. the difference, Dr. Wan. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, like I was telling you before, what, what causes this is that bacteria accumulation and your body's trying to fight it off. So your tissues can, you can notice a red inflamed or puffy tissues in, uh, uh, in your mouth. And oftentimes patients will notice like when they're brushing their teeth, they might notice some blood mix in oh their yeah. saliva or some bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, common feature that patients will notice is they'll notice um, that the teeth may appear longer because the, the tissues have receded or moved down the tooth because of the loss of bone support. We always used to laugh at that statement when we're describing someone who's older and say, oh, he's long in the tooth, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. But really, that indicates that the gum is beginning to recede, mm -hmm. so more of the tooth is actually showing. Exactly. And sometimes it's not so pretty that which is showing, right? Exactly, exactly. So we've got a bi uh, healthy gums on the left and, ooh, ooh, unhealthy Healthy gums, gums on the right. Exactly, and you'll see kind of the little bit of the puffiness of the tissues and some recession um, in on some of those teeth, which is again commonly seen with, with the periodontal patients. What about people who have dry mouth? Dry mouth is actually very commonly seen in a lot of older patients because one of the side effects of many medications patients are taking oh, can cause sure. that. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So that you know that can be a very significant um, problem for patients because the you know what what what's going on is that your your body's decreasing the amount of salivary flow um, in your mouth and so it doesn't moisturize the tissues and the tissues can get very friable and it, it is hard you know even to chew food and and so forth. So that can be a significant issue for a but, lot of our patients. But what if you drink a lot of water? Is that going to make any difference? That, it, that will definitely provide some benefit because it's just basically if you have something in your mouth that's going to help with increasing s the salivary flow. And that, that's why in patients that have dry mouth oftentimes will recommend, you know, having them um, ha um, keep like a sugar-free candy in their mouth ah. because that kind of stimulates um, the salivary flow or you know if patients don't like to have candies or whatnot in their mouth what they can do is there's also um, mouth rinses or toothpaste or gel products that can be used um, for patients specifically with dry mouth. What about chewing gum? No, that is, again, that kind of goes again with the dry mouth, you know, that's definitely, it stimulates the salivary flow, so it helps kind of keep, one of the important things with the saliva is it helps not only moisturize the tissues, but kind of helps cleanse the teeth. So if you're chewing gum, obviously we recommend chewing uh, a sugar. I knew sugar, you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you'd say sugar-free sugar gum, ex but, but gum, is, and I no, I love to chew gum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you just don't chew it like you're chewing a mm -hmm. lot of tobacco. <laughs> yep. Oh, tobacco, tobacco. Yep. thinking of that would probably be those but people who 
uh, take snuff, eat, chew snuff, that's probably not very good. Yes, because that what well, they can do, if they <laughs> chew tobacco, that can give you other issues in the oral cavity with oh. um, lesions in the mouth. Um, so most definitely, it's if you can avoid any of those products, that would be good. And even just with smoking, that can play a significant risk. You know, again, like I was telling you before, is a risk factor for for periodontal diseases. Well, as we get older, the, this is another thing that we have to deal with, uh, of course. But there are some ways around it. And here are some of the things that we actually can do to preserve those teeth which we do have left. The, some of the new the new toothbrushes are just marvelous. Oh yes, they are very beneficial, and especially with patients that, um, you know, as we get older, we lose our dexterity. So it's a lot more difficult and challenging to brush. And so what these brushes can do are these are electric toothbrushes that I'll kind of turn them on. They can they basically spin, and so they kind of do the work for us. So all patients have to do is just move them around the the individual teeth. And you, you can you can reach teeth, I think, so much better, and They're and you'll you'll stay at it longer mm -hmm. uh, because these are going around so well. I actually had one of these electric toothbrushes that you're supposed to. I think it said to brush like six minutes or something, mm -hmm. or no, no, Did every every two minutes it would beep. Oh, to yes. let me know that I had been at it for two minutes, and I said, mm -hmm. "Okay, then move it over here." Yep. <laughs> so don't put it in your eye. <laughs> don't put your eye out. That wouldn't be good. Uh, but it, it, it that was really marvelous. Oh yes. Uh, of course, they they cost a couple of dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they are, there's kind of actually a wide range of them. You know, they can range anywhere from, you know, $15, 20 up to, you know, $100, $150. And they all work just as well. It's just a matter of finding one that you're comfortable yeah. with using, which is what's most important. And you can, you can get cheap ones where you can just put a battery in there and they're $15, mm -hmm. $19. Or you can get, you know, uh, you can get a, a really lovely one. but. I would highly, highly recommend the electric toothbrush over your old-fashioned toothbrush because you'll stay at it longer, it moves more quickly, and will get in and, and out. What about flossing? No, flossing is still very d important, especially, you know, because these brushes can only penetrate, can only yeah. go so deep, mm -hmm. and so it's important to get in between those teeth to minimize the chances for recurrent decay, or, you know, if there's existing fillings or, or restorations already present. So no, flossing is definitely, at least if you can do it at least once a day, great. If you can do it more, that's even better. Well, I, I know, you know, you can get the string that you put in there, and mm -hmm. it's a, a little inconvenient, and I think a lot of us don't do it because it takes more time. But uh, in fact, uh, the, my periodontist gave to me, no, I had to pay for it, and they don't give you anything anymore, a little tiny brush. Mm -hmm. that could get in there and just goes along your mm -hmm. teeth and it's so much more quick and works more mm -hmm. quickly than you know taking the, the, the mm -hmm. dental floss and going like this. So where do, are those available on the market? Because I'm finding that wonderful and fast. Yes, I think the brushes you're referring to are what we call proxy brushes. Proxy brush, that's and it. That's yep, it. and there's you. kind yeah. of a variety of sizes. There's ones that are tree-shaped or a cylindrical mm -hmm. um, shape, and you can get those at any drug stores um, that you might go to to get any medications or, or whatnot. But those are very beneficial, especially in patients with gum disease or periodontitis, because as the tissues have receded, flossing kind of can just Light, you know, kind of yes. you basically glide right over some of those areas. Uh -huh. So the, with the the proxy brushes, you can really get in between those spaces a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And so we do definitely recommend those for a lot of patients. Now, what if you have no teeth at all and you've been wearing dentures? What about those folks? Yeah, even though you might not still have teeth, you know, first of all, it's important to continue to see a dentist because one of the important responsibilities we have as dentists is doing an oral cancer screening every year, on a yearly basis at least, and, or at every appointment, because what you can do is we can check the tissues to for any abnormalities that might be present, um, because, you know, as you know, oral cancer is a, is a significant issue. But for those patients, they should still mean, you know, even though there's not teeth to brush, they should still brush around um, the tissues so but that, you know. They should brush their gums? Yes, exactly. Because sometimes food and debris can still get underneath if they have, say, a denture. They can still get underneath those areas. And so it's it's good just to even remove that, um, any food or debris or material that might remain mm. underneath. Well, and as we age, of course, and the bone shrinks and the dentures began to not fit anymore, they still have 
some new technology. And of course, these are now the implants. Let's take a look at the implants. Mm -hmm. Where do we start, Dr. Wan? Well, here I'll kind of briefly uh, give you some information as far as what an implant is. And basically what an implant is, is it's just a, a, a titanium prosthesis that's placed into areas that patients might not have their teeth remaining. Um, and I they hope they're not that size. No, <laughs> no, they're much, 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 much smaller. Oh, I can't imagine having this in your mouth, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but what these can do is they can oftentimes, you know, replace just a single tooth if patients happen to have, mm -hmm. you know, one tooth missing for one reason or another. You can have just one implant to replace that tooth. Mm -hmm. um, there's other options where um, what can happen is, is oftentimes as, um, as the dentures no longer fit as, as well because, again, the bone shrinks, what, what we can do is we can oftentimes place a couple of implants in, and what that will do is that will provide some additional support and stability of their denture because what the, this will do... The, this, this, is where the, this is actually the implant there, mm -hmm. and that goes down into the gum, right? Yeah, um, actually, the, that's just the little, um, uh, little I, attachment oh, that I'm goes on that top. The that's yep, it's actually all attached. Yep, this is attached to the implant. It's a screw. Yep, exactly. Oh, okay. So all underneath right. here, if you can kind of see, there's the actual implant itself. Oh, that, that okay. It kind of, okay. this is, pretend this is the, the bone. Oh, yeah. And so the implant is actually inside the bone. Ah. And so there's these little attachments that are um, right on oh, top. Okay. And kind of, there's also an attachment on oh, yeah. the actual denture here, too. Oh, okay. And so it's almost like a snap on a, a, a button snap. And what uh -huh. you can do is you can... You can hear ah. that click. It snaps in place. And so that helps oh, with patients sure. that have the dentures that are very mobile and, ah, and so forth. Marvelous. Of course, we, you have one more to show? Yes, yeah, and there, okay. there's kind of a, new, a newer um, concept here where oftentimes patients don't like having to take their dentures in and out. And so what we can do now is the, this all on four concept is what we place a minimum of about four implants around the dental around the dental arch and so what these implants will do is then you know once the bone has healed around them we will actually put a prosthesis that will actually hook right onto those implants and these are actually kind of screwed into place and you can never you don't really take them out unless a dentist takes them out well we come a long way but are our implants for everyone they, there's a lot of indications for them, but it's one where they're, they're not for everybody. You know, there's certain situations where it's better to have mm -hmm. implants to replace a certain area, but the best thing would be to talk to your dentist and they can give you some information as far as if it would be feasible. Um, because there's, you know, one of the things with implants is we need to make sure and consider, you know, is there enough bone to even place these implants, exactly. which can be a and factor. These are not inexpensive though. We should talk about a price range to give our viewers mm -hmm. an idea. They're, they're not cheap. Yeah, they, they're an investment. <laughs> well, you said something to me that I thought was very important. You said, but think about not being able to, to chew lettuce mm -hmm. and carrots and so forth. And what is, what is that worth to you? What is that worth to you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dr. So. Wan, l representing the, um, I was going to say the University of Nebraska, but it's now the UNMC Dental College. She's a graduate of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to announce that 48% of the people, the doctors who graduate from the uh, University of Nebraska or mm -hmm. UNMC Dental College are women. So there are more and more women dentists. I'm so proud yep. that you're one of them yeah. uh, with the Lincoln Periodontal Group right here in Lincoln. Thank you so much, Dr. Wan. Pleasure to have you. Uh, Good information. You. Thank you, Lita. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Can you sing? dance, do magic, or have another talent? Come show it off at Lincoln Seniors Got Talent. Aging Partners is hosting a talent show featuring local seniors in honor of Older Americans Month. The show tapes at 9 a.m. Friday, April 18th at the Alt Rec Center. For more information, contact Aging Partners at 402-441-6156 or email zolson at lincoln.ne.gov.